Okay, we good? Sounds good. All right. I'm Vic, K1PY, uh, RDXA member, and um, as I put in the, uh, the announcement, I'm the flag waver for field day uh, at RDXA. So I took the charter to be RDXA's field day and how we got to where we are, but also field day in general. So there's going to be some back and forth here. Um, has everybody been to, has is, is anybody here not been to a field day to kind of understand what it is? Okay, very few. Uh, it'd be good for you to, to give it a try too. Maybe this will induce you. So, let's get started. Field day, big thing, uh, especially for RDXA. Um, but who am I first? Well, I'm a member of RDXA and RARA. I've done some public service stuff. But mostly, I'm one of the field day co-chairs, and um, I'm a data person. So I've been tracking stuff for uh, since '87, when and I moved here in the mid '80s. So that gives me the field day data guy moniker. So also RDXA first. Uh, obviously, DX is uh, what we get started as. So what do we do? We chase DX. I've got many DXCC holders, uh, Gable being one of the top, with only one needed, uh, Bob, where he was down here, so I know there's several DXers uh, in, in the group here too. Um, but contests as well, uh, DX and others. Uh, you can be serious or you can be an armchair, so either one. Uh, if you like any of these things, they sound interesting. Maybe check out RDXA. Oh, all right. Uh, founded in 47, 70th anniversary uh, recently. Uh, we're a member of the Rochester Amateur Radio Association. When I first came here, I thought it was this club and that club. But RDXA is a member of RARA, which in a sense says, hey, you guys can uh, come on over just for that reason. But I hope to induce you to come for a field day reason. So many cross memberships. You won't be amidst strangers if you come to our field day. And you are cordially invited. Everybody for whatever reason. Uh, think about it. All right. So what is field day? Uh, again, my, my credentials, as it were. Since 59, when I was licensed, I've gone to a lot of different field days, so that gives me some background. Um, my favorite was the um, Southport Island Marching Field Day Marching and Chowder Society uh, at a camp in Maine. Uh, it earned its fame because we started to, at 6 o'clock, shut everything down. We marched down the driveway and crossed the road to the lobster restaurant where we have chowder waiting for the lobster. So uh, that, that's how it got its name. So to the question, what's field day? Many, many things. Um, there's some background. Uh, there's as many as uh, different field days as there are people. There's 36,000 people that participate roughly every year. Lots of clubs or groups, uh, one person or three pe people or whatever. and. Um, so the 2,900 plus groups or clubs, they can be anywhere from one station on the air to 30 or more. You can do as many as you as you want, really, um, and from one person to greater than 200. Classes. Um, so there's clubs, groups, one or two people, like I said. There's mobile, and there's home commercial or emergency power, or from an EOC. Now, I heard that mentioned here a couple times, and perhaps there's some field day EOC uh, uh, members uh, right here. And there's another variable, power sources. So you've got these choices here, and they change the category you're in. Seems to work. There's been over 1.2 million um, participants or contacts made. So it's definitely a lot that goes on. So, I thought I'd get this out of the way. A favorite question is, field day, is it 
a contest? Because it looks like one. Or it's, of course, it's an emergency exercise. So let's look at, um, no, it's not a contest. The ARRL SET is promoted by the league as its primary league-sponsored national emergency exercise. So primary was my uh, uh, accent there. So they've got that. But the thoughts for, well, there's 35,000 participants and they keep score. QSD publishes the results. They don't publish any other event results. There's a top 10 scores box. <coughs> and groups, if, if you're in a field A and you know another field A group, you might tend to you know, look and see how you've each done. So um, you compare scores. I think that's a kind of says that's four, but then there's the emergence, there's both. So, I'm going to skip this part here. So, <coughs> see what kind of field days there are. What do you think your favorite kind would be? Lay back, a wire in the trees, and a rig on the table. Operating, optional. Where's the cooler? So that's, that's perhaps a good field day. Um, some guys in the club have referred to that as inverted V's and MREs, so that, that, that uh, catches it all. All out field day, W3AO, these guys run 14, they've run 30 stations all at the same time over the years. They are always number one. In 2019, they had 32,000 points with 14 transmitters. 110 people participating. 32,000 is double the average high score for everybody else below them, since they're always number one. So that's serious. Potomac Valley Radio Club, they are one of the top contest clubs in the country and perhaps in the world. If you're a member, you are expected to get on into contest for, uh, points for, uh, for the club. Uh, they compete fiercely. They're the gold standard for me because every once in a while you can get data and so we can compare our data to theirs and it lets you know, wow, this is, <laughs> this is a, as much as is possible on any particular band or mode. Um, in one band and mode, we match them. 40 CW. We sometimes have even beaten them. Why they're the gold standard is every band and every mode is on the air for 24 hours, or at least as long as the band is open. So if it's possible, they get, they get it. So they're, they're a good comparison. All right, or something in between. So that's a huge window. Here's the definition, really, from AWR. They published this. It's a picnic. It's an emergency practice. It's an informal contest. But they put the most important part at the very end. It's fun. It really is. If you get involved in a field day, you're going to say, wow. So with all this, what would be your favorite? Here's what I'm going to predict. Whatever the heck you would like it to be, that's field day. So there's, 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 no, uh, there's no debate, really.
for us, our EXA, we just want to do the best in the class that fits our club and the interest of its members. So that's where, why we're where we are. And to enjoy doing it. And for us, well, you'll see how much we do. We obviously have to enjoy it to keep doing that. So, what's, um, to, to see what, how we got where we are, let's look at our history. It, I don't want that to sound boring, but it shows the evolution, the experimentation, the good fortune, and the fun that we've had doing it. Good fortune, you see the asterisk. You're going to see that in a bunch of slides as we go, and I think you'll get the idea of what I'm meaning by that. So all these things have a role in, uh, in us getting to where we are. <coughs> so we started. In 87, uh, when I went to the first RDXA field day, it was down in Canada uh, at Harriet Hollister State Park. And it's on a hill similar to Gannett Hill. So that's why they went down there. But it's a long drive, and there's not many resources. So uh, another member of the club and I went looking around, and we found Ridge Shelter at Webster Park. Now, that was cool. It was good access from Rochester. Uh, we were able to stage our stuff at Irv, AF2K's place, because uh, he's nearby. There's tons of resources. I highlighted one that you can appreciate. Uh, but it was a little tight. So we decided to look around. Oh, I, I need a mouse, I just realized. I can't point. Uh, so the top circle, that's where a ridge is. You go west, turn into the campgrounds, and the campground you can see in the middle there, that's the actual campground, but if you keep going onto dirt, you get to our field day site. This is the sign, so that's pretty easy to find as long as you know that's where you're going. So from 93 to 04, that's where we were. And it looks like this. Uh, thank you, Google. Um, that looks pretty big and uh, gives us lots of trees and stuff for antennas, but it's not as big as you think. Um, the horizontal bar in the middle there is about 600 feet. Now off to the left, there's more space that uh, I didn't put in the slide, but then it drops off and it's, it's very hard terrain. These different measurements are for different antenna locations and to measure coax and stuff. So this is the Boy Scout campground, formally. It's no longer active as that. Um, same uh, local resources. There's no shelter, though. There's just an overhang, you'll see. But wide open field, tall trees. So we've got some resources there. But here's a special one that comes with it. A 77-foot flagpole. And we're free to use it. So, I mean, right off we even saw that. Why wouldn't you want this, you know? Uh, and the park, these guys are great. Um, they welcome us, they help, they, I mean, they see that the place is, is, is uh, spiffed up uh, for a field day weekend. We've been there 24 years now, so uh, this is definitely working. Uh, thanks to Lloyd and TPU, he's arranging the permits with the county. For some reason, in 05 and 06, we left that um, really good place to just see if something, someplace different would, would help. So he went to the lookout shelter. At the top on the map there, that's the throughway. Uh, Clover is the road on the left of the map, and there's where the shelter is. It's got one shelter there, so it, uh, yeah, it wasn't bad. Um, it was further to stage anything. Uh, Local resources uh, were further. Had a, a single shelter, but we stayed there for a couple of years. I'm not sure why we went, but it did give us a chance to try some new antennas. And uh, this was what it looked like um, when we were there. That's the VHF tower in the upper left. Uh, the Admar generator, you're going to hear a lot about them. And so that, that was it. Um, but we decided in a couple of years to go back to uh, do the campground. We've been there ever since. All right, another part of field day. This is a field day primer. Got nothing to do with RDXA. 
you're in a class. So I circled 20A as an example. <coughs> there was not many people in that one club. Um, but part one of the ID is how many transmitters are you going to put on the air simultaneously? You don't actually have to, but you just need to be able to. So that's the 20 and 20A. The second part is a combination of group and power. That's the A in 20A. A is the top line there, three or more people, club or non-club, using emergency power. Then there's some variations of that if you're using battery. Then there's the Bs, either one or two people, if you see down the list. Uh, then there's mobiles, home stations, and EOC stations. That's F. That's relatively new. I don't know, maybe 10 years now or so. I'm bad with, with the timing. So there we go. 3A is the most popular. You can see it's 304, just uniquely 3A. There's other 3s on the right you can see with modifiers. So, but uh, that's the biggest. The, um, I don't know how I got 1D one, one as the, uh, oh, the most at home anyway. All right. I, I was saying, gee whiz, it's the, uh, uh, Got my numbers messed up. So, RDX 6 three transmitters, portable, three or more person, club, with emergency power, 3A. So, why for us? Well, size wise, we've got enough operators for three transmitters. Uh, if we went four, we wouldn't have enough people. Um, we've got more CW ops, so we've got two stations dedicated to that, and we do have phone ops, so they have one station. And some people would say, you know, we're out to win. Well, if we wanted to win, we'd have three CW stations, because it's double the points. So we're there to really serve what our members like to do or can do. So that's why 3A for us. Um, we did run 2A a couple times. Uh, at Harriet Hollister, that was the default when, when I arrived. We did run a 2A kilowatt in 02. In 0, we won our, I like this alliteration, the first number one in 01. So we said, in 02, you know, that was cool, but wouldn't it be cool to try a kilowatt? What, what could you do? So we ran 2A kilowatt. You know why? It barely made a difference in the number of contacts. You'd think it'd be, you know, double or one and a half at least. But anyway, and we did some over-the-top years in 8, 9, and 10. We'll get to that. So in 11 and 12, we did the uh, inverted Vs of MREs for two years. But then the, the urge kind of put us back to doing our regular 3A. All right, the other things that, uh, that move us on, antennas. We almost change the antennas every year. We're trying to fix things, interference, whatever, but I think it's more, you know what, if we put one of these over there, what do you think? And uh, I think that's the, the impetus behind it. So what have we tried? Well, obviously dipoles, I mean, you've got to have them. The key is where you put them. So this is where we've put dipoles at di different times. So this is 2018, the other antennas are not shown. This is phone, oh, I I want to point to the screen. The blue is phone, the white is CW, and the red is GOTA. So we got dipoles there, there, there. Well, that was a, a low 20. Um, that, that. This thing here on the right, that must have been 80 feet high. And if you look at it from the, um, on the, the left side of the screen where the commissary is, and you look up, and if the sun is right, you see that thing way the heck up there, out in the field, and you go, holy cow, that is so cool. I mean, to have an 80 uh, that high. Um, so there's others, the G5RDs and bazookas uh, ended up at Gota because of tight uh, things, so we've used them. We've tried a few MVIS. Uh, we did have one last year, but um, they not seem to, to work like they do, and maybe there's something later that will explain that. 
receive antennas we're big on, but we're not good at getting them to work. You'd think with all the effort we put in that, that we would. So we use them to mitigate interference. Um, even a, bo uh, a beverage on the ground, the bog, uh, you know, this cool to try all that stuff. There's a pennant that's kind of like, you know, the football team, so you got this thing like that. Um, so there's one there, we used them a couple of years. That was courtesy of W2LU, who donated them, donated them to the club. Many others, inverted V, we, as you probably deduced, we have a two element 40 meter beam. That's been our 40 meter antenna for quite a while, and the owner of it was ultimately gonna put it out. So we said, hmm, what are we gonna do? Um, so we thought, okay, let's try an inverted V. This would be on the flagpole. So it's at uh, 77 feet. Um, we did a two element inverted V though, because that was more interesting and more fun than just a simple uh, inverted V dipole. So I don't know, that's, that's how the club thinks. Mike KM2B, uh, he wanted to find that out. He learned NE2C modeling just to be able to come up with some information on height, angles, uh, all this and that. So uh, that, that's really cool. We have some great experience in, in the club, like you guys do hear about. The VB. <laughs> Uh, we do like to experiment, as you guessed, so uh, we, you don't see many of them. We wanted it for 80 and 40 gain. So Menden Ponds was made for this. I mean, it had the, the layout. Now, this picture is not going to be as great. I don't have uh, um, the satellite images. But look at how big those uh, slanted Vs are, um, or lambdas, I guess. The very top antenna, that's an 80 meter dipole. So you can see this thing is big. And of course, we didn't want to build just one. We had to do two on the freeze mode. So anyway, uh, that's, that's what we did. We had some fun with that. Did they work? Uh, we couldn't really tell. Uh, we didn't put enough in it to really fine tune it and this and that. So I only, only did it uh, those two years, or maybe one year. There is a couple that are really intriguing. In the club, we have an antenna guru, really a wire antenna guru. So back before we had beams, uh, the Aggies that we do now, he built monoband beams, two elements. But his coup de grace was an 80-40 pointing, two element multi-band wire that all used rope booms. Here's the deal. Putting them up is art form. And what you did is just what Fred said. Don't question, don't go off. He says, do this, you do that. And you know what? Then it's up. And uh, it's amazing. Here is where uh, we used it most of the time. Uh, perfect little um, area between the trees there. And there it is. Um, I always called it the spider web, but apparently it was known as a fishbone as well, as you can see. But here we had the most audacious antenna experiment that I think any field day club would want to undertake. I was talking with Z, K2SSS, who uses Moxons at his home station. So I guess I convinced him that maybe it'd be great to try that at field day. So he designed, built, and, and helped supervise the installation of three Moxons, and you can see them right there. Two element, 40, 80 meter, two element, and a tri-band Moxon for Goda. Here they are. So the, the big enlargement is the tri-bander, so you can see where it is at Goda. To the right, is the 80, and that was an inverted V. Uh, it, the, the top of it was at 75 feet, so that was pretty good. And then off in the phone station, we had that at 70 feet with a 50-foot mast and a 20-foot um, mast on top of that. Uh, that was a little shaky, maybe. Um, like I said, I think it's one of the boldest things, which is definitely some hyperbole, but it was 
amazing and challenging, but you can see in italics, who we vowed to never try it again. But really, we want to thank Z. I mean, that was, it was awesome. And then we have Yagis. Um, some are retired, some are still active. The A4 is the phone antenna, the CL33 is the CW antenna. We also have a, a mono band, which is kind of on again, off again. The KLM KT34XA, that's the picture you see under there. 32 foot boom, five elements, and the thing is gangbuster antenna. Um, matter of fact, the KT and KT34XA stands for killer tribander uh, by design. Uh, but we don't use it anymore because no one wants to put the thing together <laughs> on field tag. It's, uh, it's a lot of work. Um, then we have the two element 40. We had a second two element 40 during that uh, over the top period, but that, so that was one time. <coughs> All right, stations. 3A, like we said, three HF stations is what that means. So you get three free stations. Again, this is um, field day uh, stuff. Uh, get on the air which is good for what you guys are doing, because you're actually doing that. I really got to commend what Rara is doing there. That's uh, impressive. Uh, you have a VHF station, and you have a satellite station. They're all free. Uh, all the points you get count. Um, previously, we had a single phone station that ran both modes. And then the, all the other uh, bands were split between CW and phone. Currently, we have two CW stations, one 80-20-10, the other 40-15, and then phone is all bands. This here, um, the picture on the right, this was cool. It was, I guess, last year. Uh, last year or the year before? No, not the last year. Um, the guy in the middle is a Marine, and like you say, he was going to deploy in two weeks, and he wanted to come and try out GOTA. So um, we definitely sat him down. And uh, people, let's do them approaches. All right, so what's the, um, the CW station? The, the CL33, we used to use a monobander. Uh, whatever we use, it's at 50 feet on a mill mast done, uh, brought to us by the AWA. For a while, we had a 100-foot telescoping mast from Monroe County EOC. They liked what we did. They came and visited. I heard they used to boast about RDXA's field day to FEMA when they came, you know, to have those kind of meetings that county and EOCs and stuff have. So we were good PR for Monroe County. Uh, so that was definitely cool. The 4015 station, it's got the two element 40, uh, 70 feet. Uh, we have K3s actually for all three HF stations donated by the members. And we're in a canopy for the shelter. The phone station, similar, A4S, 50 feet of mast, two dipoles, another K3. And GOTA, GOTA has the most uh, variables. So we retired the TA33. Um, we're not using the club tower anymore. We're using dipoles. So. 8040, um, we have an MP or a KX3, uh, depending, or both. Their shelter, you see on the right, it's an overhang, what used to be the commissary. So uh, it kind of works out. VHF and up. We have the K2 TER over. You see the asterisk, good fortune, definitely is. I'll leave you to, to see. <coughs> <laughs> what, what, what's in that thing? Um, but that is a, a TV a remote uh, vehicle that Bill got from Chicago somewhere. And uh, definitely cool. Satellite, again, good fortune. The, uh, the M-square uh, antennas and the Azel and the satellite tracking were donated to the club by Jeff, W2FU, and um, that's, that, that got us back on the uh, getting satellites. Uh, 
JFK2DH is the guy, the satellite guy. FT8. I heard FT8 here in digital. If anybody's interested in FT8, you want to come to our field day, because we're going to have three stations on the air. We need people to operate them. We really do, uh, to be frank. So uh, we have one at the phone station that shares antennas uh, with phone. We actually, uh, last year, we unplugged it from the phone rig, plugged it into the FT8 rig. We're going to try and fix that uh, this year um, in, in a real nice way, actually. VHF, we wanted to get on six meters, so we kind of did that. Uh, GOTA, we, we want people on GOTA. Um, you can come there to learn FT8 or to coach FT8. And we're definitely going to need tons of people because we've got those three stations. We'd really like to have them on the air. And uh, FT8 is, is pretty awesome. Spotting a station. Huh? Um, maybe a few people know what this is, or maybe a lot. It's a receive-only rig, well, it's a, a rig, but it's dedicated for receiving only using just a beverage antenna, no transmit. It's networked with the CW stations, they're the only ones that are involved right now. So here's how it works. Um, the, the spot operator is tuning the band, good old search and pounce. He finds a station, he log, puts it in the call sign field of the logger, and if it, um, shows if we've worked them before on the band they're looking, it says dupe. Okay, that's because of the networks of the logging program. Uh, finds another one. Ah, good. He types it in, puts the information in, hits a, hits a button, and it posts it on a band map. I tried to get a picture, but I couldn't. The CW operator on that band sees this pop up on the band map. Well, he's CQing, but when he has a break, he's going to click Click on that spot. It's going to put the call into his logging field, going to change the rig to that frequency. He waits for the guy, he calls him, works him, presses the button to log it, and it bounces back to his previous frequency and he goes on securing. Uh, this is awesome. The, down the bottom is a number circle. On either side, you can see uh, contacts that are about 300 less than in 2017. We're attributing that 300 to the spotting station of that year. Since then, we've kind of gotten all messed up and to get the spotting station working right. So we're really going to try and fix that this year, too. And I don't know why I said it this way, to top it all off ground runs. Maybe because for years and years, we're saying, we've got to have grounds for everything, but we never quite did it. So this year, thanks to this guy, AC2RL, we're, um, we have him with GF, S, uh, GFCI protection. And uh, what we learned we need is we need a little poster next to the thing. How to reset this? Because it, uh, it tripped and uh, we kind of got uh, sidetracked to fix it. Um, there's a central hub by the generator because it's in the middle. Um, and we either have Wi-Fi or Ethernet. We're going to Ethernet for this coming here. Uh, Wi-Fi sometimes had some issues. And the computers and all that, they're all club-owned. Computer locket, N1MM Logger Plus. We used to have right log. Um, this is really a contest-only logging program, and it's really built for multi-ops. And um, so it's great for the networking, and it helps us with the band map. <coughs> All right, what special things got us to feel that? Good fortune. Here's where I'm going to summarize them. So the Webster Park, you can see the picture there, and the flagpole. That thing is magnificent when you, when you see it just, just out, especially on a nice day, with the sun reflecting. Um, AWA mill mast since 2005. Uh, that's thanks to the guy in the bottom left there, Lynn W2BSN. I'm pretty sure he's a rah, -rah guy. Um, so those things really help, and you can see on the right, that's a 50-foot mast, and um, it, uh, it does a great job. Admar generators. For 20 years, those guys have been letting us have one of their generators. All we need to do is return it with a full tank of diesel, okay? 
and uh, that, that's great. We, uh, we really owe them a lot. And there's a power panel that, that we use uh, for power distribution. Here's a super good fortune for two or three years, the county's 100-foot telescoping tower. That thing was great. They'd come and actually set it up, with, you know, we'd put the antenna, they'd raise it, ah. Um, we had lots of available Yaggies that weren't up on somebody's tower, so I unfortunately had several of them because I had great plans that never got fulfilled. Okay, what other things kind of move you along? Well, competition. Uh, it's not necessarily why you're there, but when it presents itself, it, it kind of says, gee, you know, could we? Um, WNCA, they were a uh, business, uh, a, a company uh, field day club. They owned it for about six, seven years. They owned it. 26 to 2010, they were number one, we were number two in 3A. But in 08, we just got an edge and um, we got the, the number one, one out of one out of all those years. That seemed to be so impressive that we got invited to the Dayton Hamfest contest for them uh, to talk about it. I also, I made the presentation, the other half of the presentation was W3AO. They went to, to, to describe what a big club can do and we were a small club. So that, that was kind of cool. Then we had another station recently, K4JJ, down in Georgia. Uh, for six years, it was either them or us. Three times for them, three times for us. And uh, in 18, they challenged us, actually, because uh, they, they wanted to have three number ones in a row. And so they said, hey, you know, we're out for you. Uh, actually, they got it. But uh, we regained it uh, last year. All right, what's the other things? If you can't tell, there's a lot of satisfaction that comes from something like this, that you did it, and you look around, and <laughs> you gotta say, this is, <laughs> this is something. Um, an effort well done. Also, in the QST listings, we've now six times seen Rochester DX Association up there, and uh, we're either First, second, or third most of the time. Lots more firsts um, uh, recently, you'll see that. And another thing, well, what keeps you going? Well, recognition, you know. I guess we're uh, seen as putting on a major station, which I guess we do. But the overall main reason, and that's really it at the bottom, it's just a lot of fun to do that. And it's the camaraderie of that group coming together and being able to do all that and feel very proud of it. So, with all that, what kind of results? You want data? There's data. That's why I'm the data guy. That's my spreadsheet. But I, uh, I graphed it, and um, here's where we were. You can see the bottom group is five to 10,000 points. So that's where we started out. The first two years are at Harriet Hollister, and that was a two-way. So you can see the 10,000 line, kind of we've hovered around that for a while. Um, the three blips in the middle, that's not 0809. That's, okay, I don't know what bumped that up, but it did. Um, so now we're in between the 10 and, and uh, 15, pretty much most of the time. Those top three um, are the W9CA over-the-top efforts that we made. You know, we, we, after we did that, we said, we can't do this anymore. But uh, for three years, uh, we, we tried. Um, to summarize that, we were in the top three 17 times in the last 25 years. Uh, and six of those were number ones. So we're kind of pleased with that as well. All right, I'm a data guy. I'm not gonna spend much on this, but this is the W9CA years. Looking at the data, you can look at the scores those guys have. 
and um, they're above any kind of average. The parentheses, that's overall place. Overall meaning every other club in fielding. They were third, fifth, fourth, second, and second. Second means the only other station that beat them was what? W3AO. I mean, it has 15 or 30 transmitters. They have three. Um, that is beyond awesome. The 11 score for them is the all-time 3A record, by the way. Um, speaking of overall, you can see under RDX uh, a fourth, fifth, and fifth overall. I mean, you reflect back on that and you go, Hey, Vic. Really? Yeah. Hey, Vic, how does, how does W3AO put that many transmitters on the air without them interfering with each other? It, it's just they, they use the thousand foot diameter circle that ARRL yeah. allows. They're in a big open field. They have 10 or so of those mill masts. This, this is a very um, big club with lots of resources. Yeah. All the mega stations in contesting. Well, not all, but a lot of them belong to that, and then there's another, Frankfurt, that's a big contest club. And these guys have resources to, and people with a lot of money, too. So they have everything lined, they're in Maryland, they have everything lined up in a row, end on end, on end, on end. And they do it. And I'm sure they have filters like crazy. Yeah. They do it. And it obviously works. All right, K4JJ, I didn't do the same with them, but you can see how the number ones um, went back and forth, three each. So we figured out, you know, how are they beating us? Well, in the green uh, on the right, under um, JJ, you can see 15 and 20. You look left, and we didn't have 15 and 20, uh, because they're in Georgia. Uh, that helps a lot. Uh, down under phone, same thing, and then the last green thing, 500, that's GOTA. They get on the air station that um, is really a gold mine in field day. Being data, I did a bunch of stuff, uh, N1MM will do this for you, but so this is kind of, you can graphically see where you're at. Here's one that blows my mind. From 08, to 19, there's the uh, solar cycle. Um, the first three are the over-the-top ones that we got our best scores, our highest score ever, the 18K. Look where it is in the cycle. Well, we, we burned out, so the next two years we did wires. We're at the peak of the cycle, or right up there. What the heck are we doing that? Well, we were burned out. Um, so then, you know, kind of following along. Now that we're getting down to bottom, we have a 15K in 17, and uh, it's dropping off. But I mean, it's like, wait a minute, we, we go backwards with the solar cycle, it seems. All right, uh, this is the results. We've seen what we put in the field. So how do we do it? Planning. We're going to look at research and operational stuff. Here's a great program. Uh, HFTA, High Frequency Terrain Analysis, and you get a bunch of topographical maps uh, online from the government, and you, it's, this is killer to set up, but when you do, you tell it exactly where you are and where you want to point, and it'll, it'll tell, show you the terrain um, in that direction. Well, the, little, the blue, red, and whatever dots are different heights. So the bottom one is 35 feet, next is 50, next is 70, and the top one is 85. Um, like I said, did you, see, did you say ridge? And um, you can see that we're down in the valley compared to, uh, to the ridge where we're shooting south for. So um, that's, that's a challenge. If you, for the 40 meter beam at 80 feet, we have the red arc. These things down the bottom, uh, the, the vertical bars, those, that's the takeoff angle of signals you're likely to get um, on, what, 
over the course of a solar cycle, this is the data. So maybe not at any one time, but you're going to get your dx at the low end, the low takeoff angles, and all the rest are going to be stateside and stuff like that. So it lets you see if you're covering uh, what you are aiming for. So the 80 foot is a little lower than the 120, but we can't do that. So it's working pretty well. Due west, the, um, the very left edge of the, of the, uh, the graph is that little horizontal line. That's where we're at. 315 feet above sea level this is our start. And if we beam due west, 270, <coughs> the terrain falls off in, for us that way. And to, for quite a bit, 15,000 feet on the right-hand edge of the, uh, of the graph. So the little blue dot is 35 feet or <coughs> there. And that's what you get um, with the 40 meter beam pointing west. You can see the blue is the highest, 100 feet. But look at it drops right out to zero, kind of in the middle of where the stations are. So you don't want that. Um, probably the green is the, that's 85 feet, which is close to what we have. And that covers things pretty well. So uh, that, that works. It's fascinating to have that. And then there's uh, beam directions. All right, here's a trick question or something like that. Uh, if our beam is pointed due west, 270, on the west coast, what's going to be the <coughs> center of our pattern? So choices, Anchorage, Vancouver, etc. Don't say anything, but just think. You, you come up with the answer. And the answer is, oh, there's, this is something. You can see where New York is, and that's our maps that we all looked at. Here's a great circle bearing from DX Atlas. The middle line in the uh, pattern there is 270. Follow it to the west coast. You can see that little blue dot. Where do you think that is? I think I heard it. LA. You're right. So, but how, it's west. It's not west. That's southwest. You know? How come? But great circle. So it, it's, if, unless you do have an HF beam and need to know that, you wouldn't guess it. It's, I think that's just kind of neat. Vic, you can see it if you hold the globe in your hand. This yeah. Is not that, but yep. it does, it's not the same thing. But if you hold the globe, it's like, oh, I get it. Yep. That's why you beam weirdly for Japan. Uh, so here's, we, we went, we did 240. This was to kind of analyze what we, what we uh, could get. Um, I'm going to go back one. I, I got some data. I could figure out that beaming west and looking at how many stations are in the areas covered by that, 50% of all field day stations are within that, that beam area. Oh. All right. Okay, we go down 30 degrees. Texas, you think that's where everybody is, but we're only getting 39%. Um, turn again, 24%. Yeah, I know. Turn again, I don't know. Well, if you think everything's in Georgia and Florida, 27 or 27%. So um, right now, west, but that's 20 meters. That's what that pattern is for. And west is not always open to us, uh, you know, being where we are. This data came, comes from ARRL and tells you how many stations are in each call area. So there they are on the left, zero through nine. Uh, on the right, percent of all logs. So you can see the zeros through nines. Uh, the biggest is the fours with 18% of all logs. Then the fives and sixes are 10 and then it goes down. Uh, we're doing well in the fours, 23% of all our uh, calls are from uh, are from foreland. So you look at the data in the middle there and you can kind of see where you're strong and uh, where you're not. Here's just graphical things that are kind of neat to look at. Uh, so not going to explain it much, but the green you can see that's the, the, the um, that's the 4015 station is the green. Blue, which is all bands, that's the foam, and then the purplish one, that's for that's 80-20. So you can kind of see what, and it's, it's 
kind of neat to look at it graphically. Same thing, different, different view. Um, uh, you can break things down too. N1MM does this uh, again for you. How many few shows are you making in an hour by mode and by band? So the blue on the left is CW and the box on the right is phone. You can see what you're getting and you can analyze. Um, here's what I did because I was noticing we were a lot of time on 80. Look at uh, about in the middle of the left column, the 14.5. That means in 2007, the ADCW station was on 80, 14 and a half hours. It's a 24 hour event. And you kind of say, really? And so this was to analyze all that. Um, night rates. So this is between 1 and 7 a.m. You can see how things definitely slow down. Mostly people go to bed, including the rest of the country. Um, so the rates are kind of slow. CW looks bigger, but that's two stations. So it's, it's you know, 32 was, the, the, the top 37 was the highest. But you can see what you're doing at night. Um, the three main stations, 24 hours. Um, we made 3,100 contacts there. That's an average between all the stations for each hour. The average was 129 contacts an hour. Um, so, you know, if you, sometimes you don't know exactly how to work with that. All three stations were um, at, two, at 291 and 250, the first row. They were greater than 200 contacts an hour. Um, so 291, that's, uh, that's pretty good. 150 an hour? We had four, four times and over 100 an hour for all three stations. Uh, we have uh, 11 times. So we're, we're doing pretty good with rate. This is a distribution that Raj and 2RD was able to do. It's a program he has at the U of R. But you can see 40 is green and 20 is orange. And you can kind of see also how many we're making in the far west. i got to take a sip here. It's still, the numbers are down, but um, it's still, there's no multipliers, by the way, in the field day. So working every state doesn't mean any difference. It's just numbers, pure numbers. All right. Um, now the nitty gritty, which is getting towards the end of things, too. I'm sorry, I'm thinking maybe longer. This is the, the, all the writing down there. That's the plan that I write up uh, after the field day meetings, and that's what we go by. But really what we look at is the site diagrams when we're um, setting things up. So this is the phone set up for last year. Uh, there was a, a, a choice between where to put the 40. We ended up putting it on the right attached to the uh, mill nest. And we had FT8 joining the station. And that little vertical thing above the uh, rectangle is an NVIS for 160. So we wanted to try that. But basically, it's not that the antenna didn't do anything. We just didn't hear anybody on 160. And field A, that's reasonable. Here's that antenna. CW is on the right. And you notice uh, that the little tent there to the bottom right of the CW. We had three stations in that tent. The two CW stations we have together. And uh, we're in the middle of all the antennas for, the, for them. And, uh, but we had the spotting station that I told you about. Uh, we're moving it this year. Those, the rest of the stations but may stay, but spotting may go over to the commissary. And I don't know if you can see it, but it's that little gray area um, and below the parking lot. And here's the go-to station. You add uh, the beverages, and we're going to move them as well. We're going to move them right south. The, the road that you see vertical continues through the trees. We're going to move those guys down there. Uh, you add the generator and the VHF rover, and voila, you have the 2019 antenna setup. These are measurements that we use from the Google Maps scale to figure out roughly what our coax needs are. Stations, um, you saw them, they're out in 
basically the big thing was we added FT8. That was our first year doing it. So again, FT8 people, come on out. I mean, we can put you to work. You can help us. You can have fun and see what it's all about. Uh, yeah, you got a plan for coax and rope and all that. This is a good example with Ed there uh, untangling stuff. Okay, strategy. We seek you by default because no one can work you if they don't hear you. So if you're calling, they hear you. Um, so that's why we seek you. 40 and 20 are the two big bands. We like to check 15 and 10 because we've missed it. CW is request spots, band hog. Um, phone, almost the same thing. CQ, figure out when your run times are and when, they're, when it's slow, go to FT8 is what we want to try and do. Or FT4, we don't know which one it's going to be. Uh, apparently there's things to still work out. During off, off hours, <coughs> we want to be digital as long as we can. And Goda is open to any number, any mode, through the night. Anyone can operate Goda. Now, it, you get points if it's technicians or guests or non-ops working under a coat. But you can be an extra and come on over if there's nobody looking to work it. Um, what the heck? It's there. So have fun. Um, so that, that's... And also, there's six meters for FT8 and uh, the high, high bands for FT8. So there's lots of opportunity there. We don't have the people to do it. Um, digital, that's mostly what I have there. Satellite strategy was to work them all, and I forget how many we did. Maybe a third, a half of all the passes. So just prior to field day, this is the planning again. Logistics, who gets what where? when and all that. So we get stuff on both sides of the area, but we, uh, we go get it. And the Admire generator comes on Friday, thanks to Mike K2GC. All right, it all comes together on Friday morning. The rubber meets the road, as they said, but I, I thought of that and I said, wouldn't Ed Gable say, this is where the RF meets the ether? So um, I, I bet you he'd say that. And this is also where you could become a part of our uh, really, I'm, I hope I'm not overemphasizing that, but it's really true. All right, here's our schedule. Breakfast, we start at the Nutcracker and um, then get to the site 8, 8.30. We want to make sure the porta potty is there. Uh, I mean, definitely we need it. Um, all the tasks below, we'd like to invite you. We can train you on doing those things, or you could kind of give us some, some pointers and hips. Uh, tips because you guys are doing all this stuff in all these other events. I mean, so let's let's join those resources. Uh, it'd be cool. Um, so the first thing, basically, get the uh, power panel and set up to the generator. Uh, run all those power cables. So and uh, put in the ground stakes. Um, Yagi assembly. Now that's Gable's job. Uh, mostly you can see him there. And that's putting the beams together in a particular order. We put the CW together first because the CW mill mast is going up first. So we try to uh, synchronize that way. Uh, the mill mast assembly and the Aggie installation. So you put the you put the mill mast together with the base. You get one tube. It's like eight foot section or something like that. So with the base, it's up. And then you got to get the beam up onto the top of that. And we figured out, I saw something somewhere else, we're going to use two you know, push-up things. You know, a little angle up there, and you, push, uh, you can push it up and put it in place. So we're developing all the time. Um, the wires, that's an all-day thing. It starts in the morning. Um, we've got uh, W2GT. He makes the most beautiful, um, whatever you call the things, air cannons is what I use. And uh, we use them a lot for, for the wires. Um, so th there's that. I mean, it's fun, fun to do. Oh, Friday noon, lunch. Friday afternoon, we put up the, the monobander <coughs> on the flagpole. That's a group effort. There's, um, there's the pulley at the top. 
the, the, the line runs down to the base for a pulley there, and then we pull that way. So that's a, a whole lot safer. People are away from, from the whole thing. Got to put up the shelters, so, you know, wherever they go. The computer network, um, that needs a, well, that's a lot. Uh, we're doing wire beams <coughs> this year. And pizza time, 6 p.m. And basically we decided, you know what, this is a lot of work, we're going to stop. Any of the physical stuff stops after pizza. But non-physical stuff, like station checkouts, uh, will continue. And this is a chance for on-air contacts for anybody that comes and uh, you know, kind of helps out in the afternoon, stay for free pizza, and then you can get on the air if the station seems to be working, get on and talk to other field day stations. Hey, what class are you going to, you know, all that. Um, so it's good. The computer network, we've got to check that out, make sure the logging is talking. And we're going to start <coughs> training. Um, but after all that, this is where camping and field day stories. <coughs> this is an aid for an MP. Uh, the only controls you really need to look about. Don't touch anything else, unless you're familiar with the MP. Uh, train on the N1 and M Logger Plus. Um, how it interacts with the uh, computer. There's a talk function that one station can talk to the other. We don't use it much, we should. CW spotting, how to, how to find it, how to post it, and for the ops, how to grab it. Call history. This is the coolest thing. You can, you can get a, a log, a file of all the stations in the previous year that sent in the log to field it. You load that in N1MM, set the right uh, buttons or whatever, and when you uh, type in a call, it will provide the information that they gave you, you or whatever, but uh, last year. So it's got to fill out. So if they just confirm that they were 3A in West Virginia, good. You, you, you log it and you say thanks. Uh, so that's very cool. Pre-recorded messages, N1MM logger takes care of the CW phone. Uh, they have a uh, built-in voice Kia on the K3s. We hope to have three K3s at the major things again this year. And beverage switching. The thing there is people forget. And uh, I think we, I know one time at phone, we ran almost <coughs> a whole day using the beverage. And we were running, so we couldn't tell. So beverages can be awesome. But you forget that you, uh, whether you're on it or not. And training for GoDo. This is big. This is where you guys could help a lot, too. Um, here's the outline that I came up with. Get the operator that you're going to work with onto the schedule, okay? Because you can't just hop in. Otherwise, it's six people at a time. That doesn't work. Get to the simple basics. Talk them through an off-air contact where you, the coach, you know, you're the other station. Da -da 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 -da. Um, then listen to someone making real contacts. You know, somebody that's on already. Get them familiarized with the operating aids that you're going to have, and I'll show you that. And get a logger for the person that's going to be the operator, because doing both with no familiarity is, is a challenge. Especially listening to things on the air you're not familiar with. So listen to somebody who's there until your time is ready. All right, here's a um, exchange that I came up with. This is pretty much what I do on phone. So field day, whiskey two, radio, delta, x-ray. I know that's not proper phonetic, but uh, kind of works. Field day. So you hear their call. This is a go-to station, too. They're going to do the same thing. You hear the call. The trouble there is if they're not used to the phonetics, but that's something you've got to deal with. So you go back to their call, 3A, Western New York. They give you kind of the same exchange. You say, thanks, Whiskey 2 Radio Delta X-Ray, feel that, and you go on. If you are comfortable with that, you can work a lot of stations in a minute. Um, I had, N1MM gives you some data as to rates, meaning how many you, you get. 
four people were at a rate of 500 an hour. That's eight stations, pretty much, uh, that you can work in a minute if you have the right rate going. I was on that list. It was a very short time, but the point is, if you know how to turn contact around, you can do a lot. Now, what's the point? I mean, gee, wouldn't you say, well, thank you very much, you had a nice signal. That's cool, it really is. But the whole idea of what this event is, is to well, how, prove how many you could work if you really had to um, you know, handle an emergency. So that's kind of what it's about. And if there's no answer, you go back up. So, all right, Saturday, breakfast again, or at the site, training continues. Uh, finish up all the tasks, and then lunch. At two o'clock, operating begins. At six, we have a pasta dinner, courtesy N2JQR, who comes with his trailer and the whole bit. Sunday morning, <coughs> meaning midnight, uh, CW spotting, digital all night, we hope, 7 a.m. breakfast. 10 a.m., we start taking down the antennas we're gonna wanna use, the beverages and the 80 meters. Um, Sunday lunch and 2 p.m. It's all over. Well, the fun part's over. Uh, take down, close field day. We officially close it so that we can unofficially start some refreshments and post field day stories. We have a 50 50 that helps uh, support things, and we try to put together a preliminary score, figuring bonuses of this and this and that. Here's the food screen, uh, what we have at the club, the club sponsors, whatever. Uh, we also have a QRO coffee bar, thanks to Tom, KC2VHS, um, but we have regular coffee and, and, and bottled water and all that. Bonuses are a big factor, uh, 1,100 or 1,500 points. Uh, you can get a lot and stations can win their position with a good go to turnout. And again, that's where you guys can be a big help. So, things we always need. Uh, this is the last. On site visitor, people come with their HTs and stuff. Well, you know, if, if they're not going to be an operator, they can work us. But what I just realized this year, never before, they could work W2AM too, which is the uh, AWA call that Gable arranges for us to have for a go to station. So, give an HT, two bands, you could work you know, W2RDX at the rover, and then you could work GOTA, you give us four contacts, that all helps. But we need people to be there and greet them and kind of say, hey, you know, you want to do this? And then get it set up. GOTA coaches, again, the biggest thing. Top guests through, we got aides, tech class operators. Well, basically, we want everybody. You don't even need to be an operator to work GOTA. But if you're tech class and all that, uh, that helps. CW spotting, well, we need people in the search and pumps operators to, to do that. Unfortunately, the times are bad. Um, FTA, uh, you're, you're hearing me. We, um, we have all three stations, uh, I went too fast there. But uh, this is where we need people. FTA, come, come to our field day, or anybody's field day, they're all gonna do it. Uh, Xerox is just down the road from us, so that's cool. We work each other out with this stuff. It's great. So here's one of the most welcome achievements of last year's field day. A light in the porta potty was always everybody's complaint, so we got one last time. All right, I'm sure I went over, but questions. Uh, if the meeting needs to end, I can be here after no, we're, the meeting we're, we're if good. anyone wants to stay. We're good. And. If you're interested in any of this and think you might want to come and find out more, put your call and email on this. I will take this and I will directly uh, email all you guys and we can talk about or email about any aspect of this you want to do. And uh, I, I can explain whatever it would be for you. All right, thank you very much. Questions? Maybe I gave it off. So Go ahead. you mentioned, you mentioned um, inviting technicians to the GOTA station and kind of outlining it that way. Is that the official limitation of a GOTA station that it be a technician in the last class? No. 
That's why we said anybody can operate Coda. But if there's a tech there, that gives us points. Or a non-licensed person, actually, uh, coached through uh, youth op, youth. There's a youth bonus, six or five or six people uh, under 18 or 18 or under. If they work somebody, they may not have a license. Um, Mike K2GC, I forget his last name now. He's got four Maynard. boys. Maynard. I thought it was that, but I didn't want to risk it. Um, we try to get them on, but sometimes they're, you know, just running around the field there. But um, that gives us points. Go enough for us. If we get points, that's great. The main idea is to get the station on the air and have people that would like to operate it, operate it. Really it is. It's going to be a pretty good station too, especially this year if we, if a plan that I came up with works. No, I don't want to say any more. Go ahead. You said that you vowed never to use mocks and antennas again. Is that because they didn't work, or was it just too much hard work getting them up? Way too much hard work. Okay. It's amazing that they went up number one, took hours, lots of ropes and lines, and this. And, oh. <coughs> They worked kind of, kind of okay, you know. Uh, I never did compare that year to the others, and I really a box on comparison. But uh, oh, it was just, oh, you know, you'd never want to do it again. Vic, you you put the Yagi up on that seventy foot black pole. How, how did you turn it, or how did you control it? We don't turn it. We don't you turn just, any of our beams. You just fix it. But we could because we have tag lines basically to keep the thing from tilting this way and that way. So we get three tag lines, so they're tied down. If we wanted to rotate it, we just undo the tag lines, go like that, and guide them again. But we had rotators for a couple of years. We never used them, it seems. I mean, it's a great idea, but especially for those west, 270 degrees, you know, Washington, Oregon, that's a mecca now. It's, it's as much as L.A. and San Francisco, but uh, it's too limited the time and all that. It's not worth the effort. What, what type of things do you do if you have a thunderstorm or something like that? We go <laughs> under the canopies. And just let everything fall down if it's going to... Well, <clears throat> if you're talking, if it's getting to be, holy cow, uh, no, we shut down, we'll go under the overhang at the commissary or the state. We've got walls or sides to, to the canopies that the stations are in. But uh, yeah, we did shut down one time when it was really bad for a couple hours, thunder and all that business. So yeah, we're gonna unplug the radios and the antennas and all that. So you, you don't have any arresting stuff on it then, you just unplug it as a progression? Uh, well, well, yeah, but we've got the GFCIs you know, for the, on the ground, yeah. but uh, that's, you know, that doesn't handle anything like you said. <clears throat> no, not that. So, anything else? Has uh, anybody ever... Yeah, Tim. <laughs> has anybody ever gotten injured no. on, these, uh, on these exploits uh, as far as, you know, the antennas, you know, putting up, putting up stuff and everything? Nope. Um, we have a safety officer now. It's Lynn, W2DSN. That's part of the new um, ARRL field day things. But it's really a good idea. It checks to make sure you're doing stuff. We try to get hard hats for the mill mass setups and uh, any of that around the, the uh, flagpole setup. Um, we're working slowly and carefully. Um, there was only one accident ever, and this wasn't our fault, but still it happened. Uh, at the ridge shelter, there is a chain link fence uh, around the edge, and it goes down to other parts of the camp. A kid climbed up the hill to the fence, saw a rope holding something, and untied the rope, and the antenna fell over. No one was there, but it did break an element. And uh, so we, you know, but that's the only thing ever. So I hope I didn't jinx it. Uh, we've been, we've been did you get your eye? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> they put them on the go to station. <laughs> Go to back at that time was Technos. Okay, anything else? Again, sign up here. 
I will get in touch. If you have any questions, sign up. And maybe you don't want to come, but you want to ask some questions about something, that's fine. Uh, I'm I'm the field day guy. Yeah. Do you have any photos of the actual field day site? Uh, you know, like your cooking station, uh, operating station? Uh, yeah, uh, some of them were there that we went by too fast. So, um, I think we yeah, had some we, of them in the rag did. last year, too. What's that? I think we had some pictures in the rag last year. Yeah, I've, <clears throat> I've written some articles, so yeah. um, that that marine go to picture was in the rag, along with others. Come we had a picture of... Uh, Come on out and see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Again, contact me. I'm happy to discuss anything field day with anybody. But also, take our invitation. Come on out. Okay? Well, thanks, Vic. You're welcome.